uh, the teacher candidates that, oh, there we go, that are uh, just the window popped up. That's when I get distracted. <laughs> so forgive me for that. Um, I do want to start by acknowledging that the land on which the University of Ottawa stands is the traditional unceded Algonquin territory. And I'll have my colleague introduce herself in a minute. Um, my name is Nicole Van Wittenberg, and I am the chair of the Ontario College of Teachers. Um, and I've been privileged uh, to be in this position since July of 2018. And uh, Eighth Council, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, comes to a conclusion at the end of June in 2021. Uh, I am a teacher by trade. Uh, um, and I'm a very passionate one at that. Um, I've taught anywhere from kindergarten up until grade eight. But when I taught kindergarten, I recognized that that is the toughest job in my opinion. Um, and God bless any of those individuals out in the crowd today that uh, aspire to be a kindergarten teacher because uh, my opinion, you should be paid more. Um, <laughs> it is a very tough job. I lean towards the, you know, the older kids the ones that can be sarcastic and get sarcasm. So around seven and grade seven and eight. So I really enjoy teaching uh, those groups of students. But I think my favorite grade curriculum wise is probably um, grade four. I quite enjoy um, the curriculum and the eagerness and the uh, willingness of the students to, uh, to uh, help out in the classroom and all that uh, stuff. So um, my, I, do, uh, I did move from the classroom on to special education, and I did that for several years before becoming a consultant within my board and then um, a coordinator of special education. Uh, and I, for anyone originally from the Barrie area, um, that's where I am from in the, uh, in the school. I work for the Simcoe Muskoka Catholic District School Board. Um, and we have quite a vast uh, territory, but a beautiful place. Um, if you're a nature level, that's the place to be. So that's a little bit about my um, teaching background. I wanted to let you know what you can expect um, to hear from us today, from uh, Stefan and myself. But before I do that, I'm going to toss the ball over to Stefan to have her introduce herself. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Stefan. I am the External Relations Officer at the Ontario College of Teachers. Um, I too am a member, but I've been I, obviously not in the classroom now because I'm working at the college full time. Um, I've been in this role for the past four and a half years. Um, love it because I get to interact with candidates, I get to interact with the faculties, um, and a number of different stakeholders in education. So. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to speak too much uh, further about myself. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Lise, who's also joining us today, um, and we'll get started with the presentation. Lise? Thank you, Stefan. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone's having a good day. Uh, my name is Lise Zufour. I am also uh, with the college on the external relations team. Um, I'm not a member of the college, but I have worked for more than 15 years in various aspects of education, including education broadcasting. Um, and uh, I've been with the college for almost a year now. And I'm, I have to say, like Stefan, I thoroughly enjoy um, having an opportunity to meet all of you and uh, helping her with presentations. So today, uh, like Tracy mentioned, I will be monitoring the chat for questions. If you have any questions during the session, please feel free to put your questions into the chat. Um, if I do see that there's a lot of questions cropping up um, on the same topic, I will uh, interrupt Stefan or Nicole and, and we'll try and get your question answered right away. Otherwise, we'll just kind of hold on to the questions till the Q&A period at the end of the session. During the question and answer period, if um, time allotting, I will also um, suggest that you can raise your hand and I will call on you to ask your question in person. Um, so that's that. So back to the presentation. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and Lise, oh, perfect. Somebody's going to do the screen for me. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of a roadmap today. Um, so you have a, uh, an idea of where we're heading in this time that we have together. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the um, concept of self-regulation and how that is connected to professionalism and why that matters to you. Uh, we'll also talk about the ethical uh, standards and the practice uh, standards as well. 
I'll explain what the role of the college is um, and its specific responsibility to that. And we'll also discuss um, how you can get involved already at this stage of your very exciting career path into education. Um, and it is an exciting uh, path for sure. I know that uh, you will forever remember <laughs> your first year in teacher uh, candidate program in 2020 because I think we'll all remember 2020 in, in various formats throughout our lives. So without further ado, let me jump right into the aspect of self-regulation and what that concept and idea is all about. Um, so self-regulation is it really has a long history in, in Ontario and we're obviously not the only profession that is regulated. In fact, there's probably a, around 40 or more professional regulators in Ontario. And if you think about the types of other professions like doctors and nurses um, and, and physiotherapists, for example, that are all regulated in Ontario. But did you know that only Ontario and Saskatchewan have um, professional regulators for the teaching profession. Um, a while ago, British Columbia had one as well, but they, um, they, there were uh, certain things that happened where the government has now assumed that responsibility once again, and they don't have an arm's length uh, distance body like we have in Ontario and Saskatchewan that uh, regulates the teaching profession. So that's an interesting um, little tidbit there. Our college, uh, the College of Teachers, the self-regulator, was established way back when in 1996, and it was based on the recommendations contained in the Royal Commission on Learning. And they really indicated at that point that the teachers joined that long list of professions to self-regulate, to set the direction of the teaching profession, and to really take responsibility um, in the public trust for determining what the standards are and how to uh, regulate the members of the profession. So we joined a long list in law and medicine and nursing as an example of uh, bodies, who professions who self-regulate. And when we think about self-regulation, it really is a privilege because we are, as I mentioned, at arm's length distance from the government and we do get to determine to a certain extent um, the privilege of determining where we wish the teaching profession to go in Ontario, the direction that has been set. And it is really operating in the public interest so that the public can take great confidence in their certified teachers that stand and work with, uh, uh, with their students in classrooms in publicly funded schools across Ontario. So it also recognizes that maturity of the profession. So it's honoring that spe special skill set that, that, uh, that teachers have, understanding the pedagogy um, and the knowledge and the experience in um, facilitating the learning of uh, children as young as three all the way up to um, students as old as 21 before they leave the public system. And it really indicates also that that government publicly has that trust and faith and confidence in our profession um, and extends our uh, privilege to be able to regulate ourselves. And again, I can't emphasize enough how much important it is that it is based on the public interest in which we set the direction. And you'll know that Ontario certified teachers enjoy a very high um, respected reputation, not, in, not only in our province and in Canada, but on a global scale as well. So I'm not sure who's advancing the slides for me, but if you could do that, that would be great. Thank you. So I, I believe you have access to this very handy um, pamphlet and I would suggest that you keep it at your fingertips um, because it really is important. When I first got started, uh, and I'm gonna reveal my age now, you can do the math, Back in uh, 1998, I was certified. So I was at the faculty in 1997. And we knew that uh, at that time, uh, education was uh, political. <laughs> and I say that because that was the time of Bill 160, which you may be aware of, um, which uh, actually had... Um, uh, I was going into my practicum and the teachers around the province 
um, demonstrated at Queen's Park at that time. So that shifted a little bit how my practicum ended up going. So I can relate maybe perhaps to some of the um, changes that are happening in your program at this time with some practicum um, issues that may arise because of the uh, pandemic situation. So I, I, I uh, empathize with your, with your situation, <laughs> um, but resilience and flexibility sure gets us through a lot. So this pamphlet is really handy because as an organization or as a, a teacher candidate and eventually as a teacher, depending on where you uh, choose to um, work or be employed, there are many different organizations that are going to cross your pathway. So we all know that the Ontario Ministry of Education oversees the province's education system. They're in charge of um, uh, policies, determining the curriculum, and directing the school boards of what they need to execute as um, the, the employers uh, of public education in Ontario. Then we also have the district school boards. Um, and you know there's four different systems in Ontario. Well, they're the major employers of Ontario certified teachers. So if you're looking for a job in the public system, you would apply to, um, the, to the different public school systems in Ontario. So they are directly then related um, in your relationship with them as an employee and employer, and they respond to the local community needs. Then you also know that the, once you are um, employed by one of those publicly funded school boards, you automatically become a uh, union member or an association member. You're part of a teacher federation and they are purely there to serve in the best interest of the uh, members and you as an employee. So that's really important um, to understand that distinction. And then the Ontario College teachers, well, your journey really starts with us because you're already engaged with us purely by being in a accredited faculty of education program. And my colleague will explain that a little bit further. We also provide you with the license to teach in the Ontario public system. So that is an important um, start to your journey with us. And I'll just get you to advance to the next slide. So, my role is really on the governing side and Lise and Stefan are really on the operations side. Um, and so we couldn't really do any of our governance work without the great and tremendous support of the um, employees of the college, the operations side. Whereas the governing side gives the direction of the teaching profession um, that then has the staff, the very uh, um, uh, expertise and professionals working at the college execute those directives. So I'm part of the governance side, as I said, I'm part of a, a group of 37 council members. We meet at least four times a year and you can see in the pictures how large that this group is. Um, the meetings uh, that we have at council are open to the public. Um, and even though we are currently still meeting virtually because of the pandemic, this may actually be an opportunity for you to um, be able to join much easier because you can register and join uh, through virtual means and, and sit in and listen to uh, the debates and the discussions at the table. Of those 37 members, every three years, 23 positions are filled through election. And we're actually currently in an election uh, call and our election will occur in the spring of 2021 for new council to take um, its place starting in July, 2021. So this is a very exciting time uh, for council as there is an upcoming change after three years of uh, eighth council moving on to ninth council. Now those 23 elected uh, positions that I spoke of are taken from uh, the English, French, Catholic, public elementary and secondary school systems in all regions of the province, as well as we have positions for a principal and vice principal, supervisory officer. We have a position for a private school, um, a faculties of education um, member is also able to fill a spot. Um, and that closes the 23 members of the profession. Now we also have 14 members that the government appoints to our council. 
So those are members of the general public um, and they, we've had RCMP officer, we've had, uh, well, we currently have an, a registered nurse on our, uh, we have business, people who run their own businesses. Um, and we've had a variety of, of appointed members that join um, us to make 37 members around the table. And why is that important? Well, I think it's important that we have these variety of voices of diversity around the table uh, from around the province to help set that direction. Remember, in the public interest. So what do the general public expect from our professional teachers within a classroom? And that really is setting the statutory and regulatory um, direction through committees. So we do have committee works. Our 37 members are also split into 14 different um, committees that we'll uh, touch upon a little bit later. Um, but they do anywhere from, for example, accrediting your uh, faculty of education program, ensuring that you're, you're getting the education that is required so that you can be successful once you gain employment, and as well as um, doing some things as investigating the public complaints that may come forward um, and investigating whether the individual member of the profession um, should see, see some disciplinary action um, to, an, uh, to uh, their conduct. Um, and again, those committees do all kinds of work throughout the year. Um, so it's quite involved with the work that these uh, council members do on a voluntary basis. So I know it may seem a far distance away, but we can never have enough enthusiastic um, teachers entering the profession be part of this. You're often that fresh voice that uh, gives illuminated insight, especially considering your closeness to doing the research and the uh, action research that you're involved in in your program currently. So I'm going to pass it to uh, Stefan at this point. I started talking without unmuting myself. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Um, all right, so just before I move on to the next slide, I, I just want to see, uh, Nicole did mention a little bit uh, about uh, the difference in the work that we do. So uh, with Nicole being more on the governance side of things and myself and me as being part of the operational aspect of the college. Um, in uh, her description of the work that the college does, she did mention a few of the college's main responsibilities, uh, which fall under the college mandate. But before I bring up the next, uh, next slide that will give you those answers, I'm gonna see what do you think the college responsibilities are? And I'll give you a quick tip. Uh, there are four main responsibilities. So using the chat, I'm going to ask you if you want to um, uh, provide some answers and I'll give you a couple questions to start typing, uh, to start typing in your, your answers. All right, we've got curriculum setting, we've got regulating in the public interest, licensing teachers, protecting the public, accredit teacher education, teacher certification, membership, licenses, overseeing disciplinary hearings, licensing teachers, teaching standards, licensing, setting the standards for teaching. Someone caught on to our tagline there, licensing. Um, I can see a few of you have opened up uh, the brochure, Who Does What in Education? Financial support for schools, set ethical standards and standards of practice, investigating complaints, approving additional qualification courses. Okay, guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate that you're participating 
and obviously you've been paying attention. So this is great. This is what makes the, uh, the interactions and the presentations far more enriching when we can see that uh, you are engaged and you're participating in what's being uh, presented. So uh, thank you for some fantastic answers. So let me, uh, let me move on to the next screen where we, we will go over our four main responsibilities. And uh, many of you did get it with the licensing aspect. So um, as the regulatory body, we are responsible for setting the requirements for entry into uh, the profession. So uh, we also issue the licenses. Um, someone else, uh, quite a few of you mentioned that we are in responsible for investigating complaints. So that's what I say, what we giveth, we can also take it away. So yes, we are definitely responsible for investigating and resolving any complaints that are brought up against our members. Um, someone did mention uh, the accreditation piece, which is the one that most people tend to forget because it is quite unique for a regulatory body to uh, have the responsibility of accrediting providers as well as professional development coursework. But yes, we are responsible for accrediting all of the 17 faculties across the province that offer the initial teacher education program, as well as the providers uh, that offer the AQ courses, the additional qualifications. And lastly, which was picked up as well, um, was setting and is setting and enforcing the ethical uh, standards of practice for the profession. So uh, kudos to all of you. Um, again, thank you for your responses. Now, the one thing that I want to mention, and it, what, it came early in the responses, um, is that everything we do is done with transparency because we are protecting the public's interest. So whoever um, did target that response, uh, fantastic that you are aware that that is our responsibility. Everything that we do is in the public's interest. So I'm gonna pause here and turn it back to Nicole, who's got a question for you as well. Thanks for that. And um, maybe Lise, can I bother you to just copy and paste that um, question into the chat box? I know um, I can't find it right now, but I know that um, I'm a visual learner. So I always, I, I hear things, but I do better when I see things. So I'm sure there's other learners out there like that as well. Sure thing, Nicole. I'll, actually, I'm going to ask Stefan to do it because she has the notes page in front of her. Okay, my apologies. No worries. Thank you, Stefan. And Nicole. Maybe oh. I'll give you a three second interlude to tell a really quick story. <laughs> I'm a storyteller. So I often think of, um, of, of teacher candidates and the, the, the amazing work that they do when they head into the school to work with their as associate teachers. And hopefully you've had um, an introduction already in relation to that. Um, and the best the best experience that I've had working with uh, a teacher candidate um, came because I'm a horrible speller. So I always try to think of ways to help students recognize that, don't worry if you're not a very good speller, there's always tools that you can use. But this associate teacher, or sorry, this uh, teacher candidate made a really great game out of it where the students were completely enthusiastic about every time I spell, misspelt a word or was on the wrong track. Um, and so what she ended up having is um, instead of the jar of, you know, how the jar of, um, you know, if you do something good or anything, this now purely came about um, if your, your teacher has, if you're helping your teacher spell a word correctly or helping anyone else spell a word correctly, um, we get that jar filled with the, with the marbles. Um, and in the end, what the, what the, um, what the reward was, what the kids were thrilled about, was actually having a spelling bee. So just an informal uh, spelling bee with some uh, treats at the end with, with the groups of winners. So it was an exciting little thing um, to learn something new. And I think it's a reciprocal relationship. You teach your associate teacher as much as you learn from them. So I just wanted to um, interject with that little bit of a story. 
uh, okay, th sorry about that, Stefan. I made you uh, <laughs> work extra hard. Um, so the questions posed here to you. Find a teacher, uh, find a teacher is the public registry on the college website where one can find any teacher who has been certified to teach in Ontario's publicly funded schools and their employment history. Is this true or false? Look at all the answers. And I like the person with the shortcut. Nice. <laughs> Nice, I love it. Okay, well, we obviously have a very smart group here, I think. What do you think, Stefan? Definitely. All right, so uh, overwhelmingly true, and <laughs> nobody's come out uh, with false. So you're quite right, it is true that um, you can use the public registry or you can use find a teacher to access the public registry. So. Let me just navigate to the website and I'm going to head back to, well, actually on any page of our website, what you will see is the section find a, uh, find a teacher. And uh, at th from this uh, portion, you can type in any teacher's name and pull up their, uh, any certified teacher, I should say, and pull up uh, their profile. So whether you have their registration number or not, even typing their name would be sufficient. So you know what, let me just go back to here we have uh, our deputy registrar, Chantal Bilil. And let me just make sure I increase the size. I hope this is a little bit clearer for everybody. All right. So what can we find on the public registry? You see you have uh, the member's name. You see their registration number and the date that they were certified and the status that, uh, that they're currently in. And um, our deputy registrar is in good standing. We sure hope so as deputy registrar. Now, if you take a look at the little uh, info buttons beside each section, it just provides you a little more information as to what kind of information you will find in that particular section. Next portion are the degrees earned by Chantal. Then the teacher uh, education program she completed and where it was completed her basic qualifications um, or the grades that she's uh, qualified to teach, including the subject areas, and then any additional qualifications that she's acquired throughout the course of her career. At the very bottom, you see the status history, and you'll note that there are two different certificates listed here. So there's the Ontario Teacher's Certificate. Um, now Chantal was certified pri uh, prior to the establishment of the college. So it's called an Ontario Teacher's Certificate when it was issued by the ministry. And then with the establishment of the Ontario College of Teachers, um, her certificate became a certificate of qualification and registration. And that's uh, the certificate that you will earn once you've completed your program and meet the requirements. Now, the one thing that you will note in this is that there is no personal information that is listed on the site. This is strictly uh, just qualifications and degrees that, that have been earned, nothing else. You will not find employment, um, employment history and you only know that Chantal is our deputy registrar because I've mentioned it to you. But otherwise, you would not know whether Chantal is working for a school board or in uh, a different aspect or a different domain of education. The last thing that I want to pull your attention to are the three letters after her name, the OCT. So OCT doesn't stand only for Ontario College of Teachers, as you see. Um, uh, the logo behind uh, Nicole today, 
but it also stands, it is our professional designation. So it stands for Ontario Certified Teacher. And this is a professional designation that was approved by council as of 2008. And as of 2008, we encourage all members to use this professional designation because it really indicates to the public and to students that you are a qualified professional who acts with integrity and um, who has the student's best interests at heart. Um, so it really demonstrates that you are a professional. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole who will speak to you a little more about professionalism. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and, and just one other note about uh, the registry. It, the, I know that we really see a spike um, in people using that come every beginning of the school year, September. That's when people tend to uh, look at the, their teachers, their child's teacher, and look at the qualifications. Um, and that's when we see the spike. It's also um, interesting for those who discover the site to then start looking up their old teachers, but we won't mention who does that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about professionalism. And really, um, I have a question for you that maybe I'll I'll post here in the chat box that I can get you to respond to. So what are some of the attributes and qualities that come to mind when you hear the word professionalism? And go ahead and take some time um, to type in some of the words that come to mind, so attributes or qualities. So preparedness, punctuality, honesty, organized, flexible, level-headed, personality, tact, integrity, multiple times, accountable, willing to adapt to students' needs, high ethical standards, considerate, responsible, integrity, respectful, caring, definitely. We've got some really good, trustworthy. Wow, this is a, I have to say, this is a really good group of um, enthusiastic learners. They're really giving us a lot here. I agree. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. So I'll, I'll let the answers keep scrolling through, but they're, they're definitely all right on target. Um, and definitely the focus when we set the direction of the teaching profession. Um, and it is really the qualities and attributes that are inherent in setting a positive tone within not only your own classroom, but to your colleagues within your school and to the greater community um, when you are in uh, representing as an educator within your, um, within your profession. So as you may be aware, we do have uh, ethical standards for the teaching profession. Um, this was designed um, by a huge um, outreach um, uh, and Stefan can probably correct me, I think there was more than 10,000 people involved in providing feedback of what the ethical standards should look like for the teaching profession. You got um, that right. Yeah, and we're going to dig a little deeper here um, with this uh, very brief video that will explain a little bit deeper what our ethical standards and really what drives our profession uh, in the teaching profession and, and that code that we live by. So um, I'll turn it over to the video. Teaching, a professional commitment. From all over Ontario, Canada, and the world. We Ontario teachers support the rich cultural diversity of our communities. We are driven by a shared purpose to provide inclusive and learning environments that meet the needs of all students. As a member of the Ontario College of Teachers, we share a collective vision of the profession adhere to core ethical values and strive to embody the ethical standards that convey our professional responsibilities and commitments, which help to solidify the trust students, parents, as well as members of our community place in us. 
The ethical standards for the teaching profession guide our practices, our decisions, and our actions on a day-to-day -day basis. Our commitment to students and communities is reflected in our care, our compassion, and our acceptance towards our students and their families, our colleagues, and the members of our communities. Our integrity in our actions and our pride in promoting the Canadian values and culture in our schools. Our ability to inspire trust, promote our profession, and embody an innovative and future-oriented education by using and creating new pedagogical approaches. Our deepest respect of others, of human dignity, and of spiritual and cultural values that are paramount to the development and well-being of our students. Care, integrity, trust, respect. Four standards that inspire our educational practices and contribute to the development of our students and communities. So, um... A, a wise colleague of mine who serves on the uh, discipline committee always indicates whenever there is a case that comes forward and we have to hear a panel, um, it always means... Teaching, a professional commitment. A professional commitment we make as Sorry members of that. the Ontario College. Um, that colleague of mine indicates that there's always a breach of one or more of the ethical standards when a uh, case does go forward towards discipline. And when you think about those ethical standards, um, it really isn't everything that we do and work when we work with our students and our colleagues and the community at large. So along with the ethical standards, we also have our standards of practice for the teaching profession. And there really are five standards to that. Um, you can see the display here. There's also an accompanying video, but we won't show that right now. But let me just touch upon the five domains here. The commitment to student and student learning, professional knowledge, professional practice, leadership in learning communities, and ongoing professional development or learning. And we know that this is a continuum. Throughout your career, you will be touching upon these multiple um, elements throughout. And it's really to acknowledge that the contributions to the profession makes the Ontario society. So we convey to the public that commitment that college members make to students for this ongoing standards of practice. We know that, well, I know from having uh, been um, a teacher for more than 20 years, that what we knew back then, we know so much more now, and we adjust, learn, and then bring that back into practice. So it's a cycle of learning and implementing for the best learning for our students. Um, I am gonna take a break at this time because I know that there are some questions. Um, do we wanna address some of those now, please? Uh, yeah, we can. Stefan, is, is everybody good for time to address some questions? No problem. Okay. Okay, so I will go back to the first question, uh, which is a question on governance, and it came in from Matthew. Is it 23 and 14 um, so on council so the teachers can't form a supermajority on their own? Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, remember when I spoke about self-regulation and governance at the Ontario College Teachers is in the public interest. So it, it takes a, a, some professional members to switch and take that hat off that they're advocating for teachers, which they are not. They're advocating for the public interest. So decisions that are made or brought forward to council, no matter if you're a professional member or you're an appointed member, your focus is the same to fulfill the mandate in the public interest. Um, the reason that originally there were less professional uh, positions and it was that the diversity wanted to be increased. So I, off the top of my head, I think it was in 2003 that they increased from 19 to 23 uh, professional positions. And the election is, is a tool in order to populate uh, those positions. But once a council and a professional council member is placed in that position, the same as an appointed member is placed in their position, 
they lose all affiliation with other um, organizations in, the, in respect to how they make decisions at council because they um, act in the public interest and that's where the decision making, they take an oath or an affirmation to that effect as well. So I hope that clarified um, that question. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Nina asked, do I need a college certification to work in the private schools? So I'll take that one and maybe Stefan has something to add on to that. So currently, if you want to work in a publicly funded school um, in any of the four boards um, or authorities, then you must be licensed with the Ontario College of Teachers. Uh, the so following two questions. I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Stefan. Sorry. What I'm going to add is that that's for publicly funded schools, whereas for private schools, currently, um, you're, you don't necessarily have to be a member, but, um, and Nicole can attest to this uh, as well with one of our council members uh, representing the private schools, more and more private schools are requiring their, member, their teachers to be members uh, of the college. Yeah, sorry, I'm, least, I'm just gonna jump in because that position is filled by a member who is part of a private school, but they don't technically represent the private school system at the council table. Everyone acts in the public interest. However, they bring knowledge and experience and diversity of voice to the table on that. Thank you. Um, we did have a question, question come up about the math proficiency test um, as well as AQs, but I believe we should maybe address those towards the end of the presentation. Yes, agreed. That's, agreed. Okay, and there's just one more that came up about um, governance just now from Gazia. Committee members' objectives um, is to act in public interest. Are we using public for learners or public as overall population? I'm a little confused, please advise. Great question. So it's the public in general. So the population of Ontario seen as the public. So as where does society want uh, the teaching profession to move? So it's always acting in the public interest. What, a, what we can suffice to say, and I always compare it to, for example, drinking water. I know that I can turn on the tap, put a glass underneath it and drink it without any fear that I will um, be sick or, or that it's contaminated or anything like that. That is the public trust and confidence in being able to turn on your tap um, in Ontario and get that clean bill of health by just drinking the water. That's the exact same kind of concept that we think of in the teaching profession. Uh, whether you have children or not, but if you're sending your children to school, um, you have faith and trust in the professionalism of those teachers because there is a self-regulating body to ensure that the um, highest integrity of professionals are in the classroom teaching children. Thank you, Nicole. I see one more question has popped up about governance. Um, how are council members trained in governance so that they keep to their mandate and do not get distracted by operational discussions? Great question. <laughs> this is the exact same question that our council members struggle with. So there is ongoing training for council members when they serve in their role, whether they're an appointed member or a member of the profession. We have a governance committee that actually has within their mandate to ensure that the council members receive ongoing training. There is a, a variety of different training. We have um, outside um, um, professionals, governance experts that support that. We have online um, uh, modules that are accessible. And then we have ongoing training prior to our council meetings to address uh, certain things, um, such as committee deference, understanding uh, the mandates of the committees, and understanding also the hierarchy of the decision-making at council and the uh, committees, for example, doing all the groundwork and bringing forth uh, sound recommendations. Great questions. I think I, think I see uh, candidates ready to join council. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Nicole and Stefan. I've made note of the rest of the questions that we can address towards the end of the session. Great, thank you. Um, so we will move on to, and we do have another uh, question here, which I am going to, uh, I'm going to read out to you and hopefully paste into the window here. Uh, 
I just want to make sure I'm on the right track here. Oh, somebody already did it. Thank you so much. You're way ahead of me. So teachers are always on duty, just as a doctor, lawyer, nurse, engineer, or other professionals are bound by their certain standards of conduct. So too are teachers who are expected to be professionals 24 seven, true or false. There we go. It's like a slot machine. <laughs> All the answers are flying by. Oh, uh, there we go. So we got, we got lots of good answers, Stefan. How will you take it away? Thank you, Nicole. So uh, overwhelmingly, uh, everybody's answered true. And um, you're quite correct in that. Uh, yes, off-duty conduct does definitely matter. Um, you are, you are, we, uh, we asked you, uh, are teachers on duty 24-7, 365 days a week? Yes, uh, they definitely are. And their professional responsibilities really don't end or start or end uh, at the schoolyard gate. So it's important for you to know that conduct that's unbecoming of a member is often understood as uh, off-duty conduct, so anything that happens outside of school hours. But if you engage in conduct that undermines the public's confidence in the profession or reflects poorly on members of the profession, that, de that definitely has an effect. Actually, even the Supreme Court has ruled that uh, teachers' off-duty conduct does definitely have uh, uh, an influence and is relevant to their suitability to teach even if that conduct is not directly related to their interactions with students. So there's been a number of cases where the court agreed that um, the role that you will occupy as a teacher in society is linked to the school system's integrity. Basically, it really boils down to the public's trust and confidence in the profession. And really, uh, you can undermine that trust and confidence just by uh, your actions and just in uh, your interactions. Um, those can have a significant, a significant influence, whether it's on duty or off duty. And Nicole spoke to you about the ethical standards uh, of practice, and then as she made mention, um, it really ties well to the, uh, the whole discipline aspect. And typically, we will see complaints brought up against members when they are, they are in breach of those ethical standards, um, as Nicole mentioned. So it is, uh, an unfortunate but important part of uh, the responsibilities that the college has is to resolve um, and hear complaints that are brought up against uh, our members. So we deal with complaints that are related to uh, either misconduct, incapacity, or incompetence. And one of the things we mentioned, and we hope we really drove the point home, is that everything we do is with uh, transparency and it is in the public's interest and so to that end all of the disciplinary hearings are open to the public. One thing to note is that uh, any member that's accused of professional misconduct does have a right to procedural fairness um, and they have a right to, def uh, to uh, proper defense and usually they will turn to uh, their federation for some assistance there. And uh, similar to, uh, it's similar to what happens out in the world, you are presumed innocent until proven otherwise, or that the, and the matters are dealt with in a timely manner. Now, we talked to you about this, not a, uh, not to scare you, but really just to let you know it is part of the work that we do. But one thing to keep in mind is that uh, by proportion to our number of active members, the complaints against teachers are rare. So we've got approximately 235,000 uh, active members right now across the province. And on average, I would say that we hear 100 to 120 uh, disciplinary hearings a year just uh, to kind of uh, uh, keep, keep it in mind that the, the proportion of complaints that uh, are seen against our members 
um, versus our active num uh, members is quite low. Now, uh, the last piece that we wanted to speak to you about uh, has to do with accreditation. And I mentioned to you earlier that accreditation is quite unique. Uh, a unique responsibility for a regulatory body to hold. Um, if we survey uh, some of the other regulatory bodies in the province, that's a duty that's offloaded to a third party. But at the college, it does. Uh, it, it is one of the four pillars of responsibilities that we have. And basically, what is accreditation? It's the review uh, that we do of uh, the teacher education programs and the qualification courses that are offered. So it really is the public stamp of approval of that program. So uh, yourself, as a candidate, you know that you can count on learning the professional knowledge and practices that you require in order to face the challenges of the classroom. So you know that someone has reviewed this program and that the program you are currently in has all of the elements necessary for you to be able to face uh, the classroom once you graduate. Um, one thing to know is that accreditation is cyclical. So uh, every program is reviewed on a cycle of five to seven years. So um, you might fall on that cycle when there are reviews done. And Nicole will speak to, uh, to you about this a little bit later because it's quite possible that you, your voice can be heard and you can provide some feedback. But I'm gonna uh, let Nicole speak to you about that piece a little bit later. Um, wanted to let you know as well that accreditation piece doesn't apply just to the initial teacher education program but also to additional qualifications so we accredit the providers as well as the um the coursework that they offer so know that you can rest assured that the programs uh meet a certain rigor it's the quality assurance piece essentially is uh, uh the accreditation piece Right. Um, you see here that we're asking you to apply now. And I know that you've just started the program and you may be wondering, why are we encouraging you to start the application process right away? You still have uh, more, well, close to two years before the completion of your program. But let me tell you, um, we're asking you to apply now so that we can start communicating with you. We have uh, quite a few resources that we make available to our members, and we want to make some of those resources available to you as well. So there is our newsletter. Um, this newsletter called Your College and You was initially created for members, um, but we have created a specific a one that's specific now to candidates as well. So when you start the application process, you will start receiving uh, your college and you um, monthly. There's also Professionally Speaking, which is our quarterly magazine that goes out to members. Once you start the application process, you will start receiving that as well. So let me actually navigate to the website where I can show you how to start the application process. And one thing to note is that we're not asking you to submit the application as a whole right now, but really just to fill out the first couple of pages. And those first couple of pages, um, that's where we're collecting your contact information so that we can start sending you uh, or giving you access to these resources. All right, so you would go to becoming a teacher, applying, and apply now. And you will scroll down to the very bottom where you're going to see the apply button. Click and you'll note there's a, a few boxes to fill. So the first couple of pages, as I mentioned, is, this is where we're collecting your contact information, um, address, email address, name. At the point where your uh, application number is issued, so that's a six digit number, that application number will eventually also become your member number. That's where you can stop. So rest assured, this part of the, uh, at that part, point of the application, everything is free. We're not asking you for any fees at this point. You can stop here. 
Um, you'll create a password and is, this is something that you can uh, re-access at any point in time. And uh, next year we'll be back to speak to you about uh, the registration process and you'll take up the rest of your application at that point. So, the last thing that I want to speak to you about today, um, it's good news. So for those of you who are Seinfeld fans, you know that George Costanza says, end on a high note. So that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, the good news is that we have a scholarship program. Uh, we offer a scholarship every year, or a few scholarships, I should say, every year to candidates that exhibit uh, excellence and uh, high, have achieved um, high academic uh, high academic standing and demonstrate a high level of preparedness for uh, education. So, at this point. Uh, the applications for the scholarship program is closed. But what I'm going to suggest is that you check out to the scholarship page in uh, January. So as of mid-January, approximately mid-January, that scholarship page or the application page should open up again. And there we will have the criteria um, and the number of scholarships that will be offered next year. So uh, typically the deadline uh, tends to fall in the summer. So either at the end of June, July or August. So I'm going to suggest that you refer yourself back to the scholarship page and I'm just gonna navigate back to the website so that you could see where the scholarship page is found on our website. Go to the section about the college and scholarships. So you'll see right now, the scholarship uh, period is closed, but as of uh, mid-January, any, um, any of the criteria and the scholarships that are available for, the tw for 2021 will be listed here. So this is where I'm going to end on my high note <laughs> and turn it back to uh, Nicole. Yeah, and I believe there's some questions and I know we have about three minutes, so I wanna try to answer as many questions as I can, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, we had a question come in about the math proficiency tested testing. Um, and basically, how is it being conducted during COVID or is that being put off for now? Uh, so that would be information that would be coming from the Ministry of Education. Um, so I can only give you what I've heard uh, in regards to them um, making announcements to the faculties of education through the deans, I believe. So I think Tracy might have more information on that, but I believe that they're going to do it online. But don't quote me because it, I'm not the messenger with regards to that. So at this point, um, we have not had any official confirmation from the ministry or from EQ, EQAO that uh, administers the test about how this will look. As soon as we get that information, we send it directly to teacher candidates so that you are you're, um, uh, so that you're, you know, well informed. Uh, one could imagine that it would be an online type of test, uh, given the COVID situation in Ontario. Thanks, Tracy. Please. Thank you. Um, Hillary wanted to know what is the wait time between graduating from the BEd program and being certified by the OCT. I'm going to give that one to Stefan. Sure. Um, so with regards to the timing, you actually have control over how quickly your application will be processed. And um, as I mentioned, next year we'll be coming back to you and speaking uh, specifically about the registration process with the college. But there's a list of uh, a number of documents you will have to submit um, in support of your application. Once all of those documents are submitted, we do a review and we determine if you meet the requirements. You won't be able to, uh, for, to submit all of the documents till you graduate because one of them is the recommendation from the faculty as well as that final transcript that shows you've completed the program successfully. So typically, most of our graduates will fall in good standing, typically at the end of June, 
or early July um, if they meet requirements one and two if they've been on top of things and submitted all of their documents ahead of time with only the, re the outstanding documents being uh, proof of completion of the program. Long way of saying that it doesn't take too long. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I'm just looking at the time, so I will ask you to speak um, about fees, um, as some students were asking about that. But at the same time, could you please put up the slide for contact information so that anybody with any additional questions can send an email to the college with their question? I definitely can. Okay, so here's our contact information. If there's questions that we don't, we haven't managed to answer today, you can reach out to our client services. Um, they are available Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to uh, 5 p.m. Uh, you can send an email. If you're sending emails, we uh, highly recommend that you include your application number as well so that we can give you a personalized response versus uh, just a generic uh, response. Now, with regards to fees, uh, there are fees when you are going to submit the full application. At this point, we're asking you to complete just the first couple of pages of the application, which is free. The, fee the fees don't come in at this point. If you choose to submit the entire application, it's not a problem. The fees that you are going to notice, there are two of them, the application fee $140 as well as the annual membership fee $170. You would have to submit both of those fees. As you submit documents, um, we will process those documents if fees have been uh, received for you. Uh, one thing to note with the annual membership fee, it will not become active until you are actually a member of the profession. So right now, as you are candidates, you're in the program, that fee will just be ported over to the following year and will not become um, quote unquote active till you've actually completed the program and you meet requirements and become a member. Thank you. I'm just looking at the time. We're shortly after 10 and I believe the students have another presentation at 10 after. Um, so um, I, there are Trace. more questions, but I don't know about timing. Um, I think that a lot of the questions that are there are very directed questions that by calling the college, um, I think it's, that's important. Um, I know from my own experience of wor working with you is that there is always someone on the other end of the telephone line who can answer the question, who will give good information, um, and not to hesitate to do that uh, for teacher candidates. If you've got concerns, it's important to, or concerns or questions to make sure that those are directed ex uh, to the people who can best answer your questions. Uh, it's, it's important to share information amongst your own uh, networks in, in the faculty, but if you have very specific questions about your specific case, please make sure you call them directly. Uh, they'll, uh, they're always able and willing to answer questions. Um, I want to really thank uh, Nicole, Stefan, and Lise for the their time with us this morning. Um, again, as we said, uh, next year the college will be, the, uh, the OCT will come back and, and answer more of your questions, help you with the uh, registration of, uh, of your qualifications in order for you to be certified at the end of the year um, after you finish the program. Thank you very, very much. Um, and uh, we'll come back in about uh, 10 minutes, a little bit less than 10 minutes to start our next presentation. Thank you.